Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody. This is Howard Fox for my co-host, Randy Ford. This is the Success Insight podcast. Our guest today is David Tabatsky. David is a writer, editor, teacher, director, and performing artist. David has also had a hand in publishing a number of books, including The Right Choice, Your Family's Prescription for Healthy Eating, Modern Fitness, and Saving Money. He's been involved in the Chicken Soup for the Soul, the Cancer Book, which is 101 Stories of Courage, Support, and Love, Right for Life, Communicating Your Way Through Cancer, and then two books, one, Reimagining Women's Cancers and Reimagining Men's Cancers. Both are the Celebrity Diagnosis Guide to Personalized Treatment and Prevention, and his most recent book is Rx for Hope an integrative approach to cancer care, which he co-authored with Dr. Nick Chen. David, welcome to the Success Insight Podcast. Thank you, Howard. It's fun to be here. Thanks so much. So, David, looking at your background and and doing the research, I mean, everything from writing, editing, co-authoring, directing, performing, and then this focus on the topic of cancer and Part of me doesn't know where to start, but you know, sometimes you, you start from the beginning. So tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get to where, where we are today? Well, I worked for many years in theater as an actor and director and, and, and also teaching. That kind of all was triggered by my time in university. And directly after that, kind of just jumped into that full blast. And that went on for quite some time here in America and also in other countries that I was lucky to be working in. And the shift kind of came for me when my children were born and I wasn't looking to travel and take jobs here and there and all over the place because I wanted to be home and be with my children. And my wife at the time had a pretty large performing career. So she was traveling all over the world and wasn't able to to shift that so easily. And other people depended on her to keep doing that. And so I was happy actually to stay home with my kids. And that's when I started to write more. I've been, I've always been writing. I'd written many, many solo shows and had written theater material for other people and some variety shows and things like that. So it was kind of a natural transition for me to stop performing as much and to start to write more. And also it was teaching. And then in 2006, I did a book with Marlo Thomas and that led to the book that I did, the cancer book with chicken soup for the soul. They asked me to do that book. They hadn't had a cancer book with that theme in 10 years. So that one I did. Now, obviously the name of the people who started Chicken Soup and all of that, they're part of that branding and their names are on that book along with mine, but I actually did it all by myself. I didn't, I never really met them, but they're part of the the way that the book has such a good reach and has uh, so many readers because of of their success with that imprint. And so I was grateful to, to be part of that and also to be able to put these stories out and create a network in the cancer community. And then I was asked to teach workshops on writing and communication in cancer centers as part of patient outreach and things like that. So I did that off and on for a while. I still do it. I still do speeches and special events and different special occasions. And I was asked when I was up at Harvard at the Beth Deaconess Hospital there working for a special event. There, the woman who was in charge, Hester Hillschnipper, who was in charge of the patient advocacy and patient services, she asked me, can you, maybe you could come up with a book because I have so many patients and caregivers and even doctors and nurses, they're not able to schedule wise. They can't be here for your workshop. And then this happened a year later, I was there again. And she was like, God, you have to do a book, David. So I, she's not somebody to say no to. <laughs> she's really a force. Esther Hill Shipper is a force. She and her husband was a head of surgery there. And so I was like, yeah, okay, okay. I, I actually would, it was a wonderful challenge to do, to try to figure out how to bottle what I was doing and how to put it in, in, a, in a small and accessible reader-friendly book that's interactive, that really is a workbook in, in a way. You know, even on the, there's a lot of pages where I leave room for people 
to to write, handwrite in. It's also part of the encouragement to get people to write by hand because it really opens up, especially when people are vulnerable, whether it's through illness or their loved one's illness or some sort of emotional curve that they're on that's really difficult or they've been through trauma. When you write things by hand, whether you're writing a to-do list or you're writing a letter to someone who's very important or you're writing your last will, whatever it is, when you write it by hand and you see your own handwriting, there's real power there and there's ownership and there's accountability and there's inspiration that come through that as opposed to all the digital electronic ways that we type into our various devices. And so that's something that I do a lot in my in the workshops. And so it's there in the in the interactive workbook. That's right for life, communicating your way through cancer. And in this past year, that's been expanded with a new version of communicating your way through cancer and chronic disease because there is a lot of overlap there and what people are doing and what they're trying to handle and how their lives are changing. And the same thing for the people who are trying to take care of them, whether they're their loved ones or caretakers or medical professionals. There's a lot of similarities between cancer and many other chronic diseases. And in fact, cancer, some types of cancer are now being treated that way as a chronic disease, not as the devil, the foreboding, the ominous word of cancer, but okay, you have cancer. This is a chronic disease. We can treat it. We can manage it. There's going to be ups and downs, There's going to be ebbs and flows, and let's get going. So that's a different approach. Okay. So one of the questions that I'm aching to ask is if we start, if we go back to the beginning, you mentioned writing the book with Marlo Thomas. And if you're my generation, your generation, we know who Marlo Thomas is. I think there's a statue in Minneapolis for her. I think maybe more than one. Could be more than one. I don't, I'm not sure. And then there, in, in a way, St. Jude, which is the hospital that her father started. Right, Danny Thomas. There's a, there's a statue of him there. Right. I think people of a younger generation would know, they should know, Marlo. They should find out how to go on Netflix and, and just Google, and, or Google, whatever. Just find on Netflix, go look up that girl and watch that series because right. that was really progressive and really pushing the envelope at the time. My older sister just worshiped it. Oh my God. She would like the world, the whole world would stop at whatever night that girl was on and you had your one chance to see it. And if you missed it, you missed it. There weren't reruns happened many years later. And, and that this was long before YouTube and all that. So Marlo really had a big, big impact probably mostly with with women, but also with many with a lot of men, because men were trying to figure out how do I deal with changing roles of women and the changing mores in our society and all of those things. They had a lot of confused men. I mean men by nature are confused. And then when you add on that stuff, it gets pretty, pretty, pretty rough. It's not pretty. <laughs> so, it's not pretty. Yeah. So anyway, Marlo Marlo has had a big impact in a, in a whole lot of ways. And what she's done as the social outreach director and really the the face and voice of of St. Jude is remarkable. I mean, it's just stunning what they've been able to do. They've just not only saved so many lives, but just changed so many lives in the way that they're saved. What was the topic of, of the book that you worked with her on? That book was called The Right Words at the Right Time, and it was the second edition. The first one was a collection of celebrities, all really, really famous people that Marlo basically just called up herself. And then she had a staff of people working with her, but she would get the people to tell the initial story of what were the turning points in their lives when someone in a mentor position or a family position or a teacher or somebody who said the right words at the right time when they really needed to hear them. And I worked on the second book, which was quote unquote, regular people, not celebrities, just average people like you and me, who someone said something to them at a very telling time that was a pivot point or that triggered them into making a change in their life. That was a remarkable experience. First of all, it was really cool working with Marlo because she's a consummate storyteller. And 
from all her years growing up with her father. She used to tell me stories about sitting at the table, like Groucho Marx and Jack Benny and Bob Hope and all these people just hanging around the house just to like get a normal Tuesday night. She wasn't thinking about what iconic legends these, these people were. They were just her honorary aunts and uncles dropping by the house. And that was quite normal. And generation of people she went to, I think, Beverly Hills High School. That was also just normal. It was like later in life when she started to realize, oh my God, what a childhood I had. Yeah. But yeah. she grew up about all around all these wonderful storytellers, and she herself is just wonderful at it. So to break down the construction of a story and the voice and the rhythm and the tempo and, 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 and how to deliver the content and dose it out and what details are important and what aren't and, and how to support the construction of it all and the delivery and the, and the execution. I mean, it was, just, it was great. And all my theater background really made a lot of sense to her. We had a lot of things in common in, in, in that regard. So we, we had quite a great time working on these stories down to the words. I mean, Marlo was really, really hands-on with a lot of it. And so I really enjoyed that process. And I worked, there were about a hundred stories. I probably worked hands-on with about three quarters of them that kind of came under my domain. And it was a great experience. And that really led to my working to do the cancer book and then other things led, led from there. And that coincided for me personally, like I said, because of my commitment to being a present parent and being engaged on a 24 seven basis. So I had a lot of flexibility with my work schedule and that really made it easier to be the kind of parent that I wanted to be. So that worked. Yeah. Okay. So I appreciate the background there. And I mean, it's just, it sounded like a perfect partnership and just having a view into her life. But also, I think, as you had said, your your theater background, your art background, and being able to to take a story and, and work with it, I think that was definitely, a, it sounds to me like it was a, a distinct advantage versus somebody like me. I might be hard pressed because I can't necessarily put myself in, in, in someone else's shoes like a Marlo Thomas or even like you if I was asked to help you co-write a book because I, I haven't lived a, a life that was somewhat similar. Yeah, it made for a lot of interesting layers and texture to, to work in. And I think it's really informed my writing a lot, all my years of doing theater and circus arts and all of that. That's really have a big influence on how I approach most most of the stories. Even when I'm working on a really intense book about cancer, like the book I did, like Rx for Hope, the book I did with Nick Chen, who's this incredible oncologist and immunologist up in Seattle. There's a lot of scientific information in there. But as I told him, I said, since this book is not primarily for doctors, it's not meant to be a textbook in medical school. We want it to be read by a wide cross-section of people, including doctors and medical students, but also patients and caregivers who don't know anything about this, who are lost and they're scared and they're confused. So it's a question of how do we dose out this information? It'd be the same thing in a way. There's a parallel, like if you want to try and do Shakespeare with children, you can't do traditional Shakespeare the way it was originally written. It's just going to blow right over a kid's head. The language itself is intimidating. So that language is the same idea when you have a lot of big, long scientific words. They're intimidating. And so you have to break them down right. and explain them. It's also the role that, Nick Chen plays as the doctor and how he communicates with his patients and who he is as a human being. I told him that was something we want to bring out. It's not like meant to be a memoir and it's not by any means, but you know, the kinds of things like when he's driving to work every morning, thinking about what he's doing and the patients he's going to see to profile him in a little bit that way, even if it's just a few paragraphs that the people reading it go, wow, this is a human being. My <laughs> there are oncologists and pathologists and all kinds of doctors, they're human beings and they need to be seen as, as, as that for, for better or for worse. I think that makes the experience with between doctors and patients more relatable and also gives them more potential as far as what communication is possible. It sounds fascinating because I think that whole 
doctor patient relationship is somewhat intimidating. It's also really hard. It's really exactly Howard. It's really also it's really hard for both parties to navigate. I think they need to help each other. Yes. Unfortunately, in America, through the medical school system, doctors are not well trained for that type of communication. My point. That was going to be my point. Yes. Yeah. I mean, they know tons of information. They can they they have they can analyze a lot of stuff. But then, what about when they don't really know what's going on? But they have to understand who the person is and how their lifestyle affects their their medical condition and all that stuff. And also for the patient to understand the doctor and have a sense of this is a real human being who's who's here. And as I do in my my workshops that I do, I have people answer a question early on. I ask them, since you're going to see your doctor, and if you've, especially when you're newly diagnosed and you don't know the doctor, and you're only going to have a short time with them, even when they are not rushing you out, you're still, you're not, you're not going to go hang out for that half a day, go take a walk in the park and eat and relax and really get to know each other. You're going to be in there for 15 minutes, maybe 20. I, I'm, I, I put it this way. I try to kind of play with people. So what, what, I guess all, everybody, you all write down your, all the questions you want to ask before you. And I look at the faces, you know, I sort of stop and sort of try to play with them a little bit. So it's a little fun. And I look at people and I go, wait a minute, you, you I mean, you don't write down your, what you, and I look at the other person like, you don't, you don't write down your question, your question. And I'm, and then I stop and I get the whole group and I'm going, wait, hold on. Let me get this clear. You're going to go see a doctor <laughs> that you've never met. And you're scared because one, somebody said, they they, you, they think you have cancer or it's actually been established and you've gotten that diagnosis, but you've got no other information. You're going in for your first appointment to figure it all out. And you are going to just remember everything you want to ask. And you're going to remember all of your concerns when you're facing this kind of trauma and your husband or your wife or your daughter or son or whatever, whoever there is, who's ever there with you, they're freaking out and they're going to have a clear head. Wow. I've just walked into the collection of the most remarkable people <laughs> who have ever existed on this earth. I, I'm, I, I don't even know what to say now. And so I blow it up out of proportion, trying to have some fun with it. You want people who, whose jaws are dropping because they never thought of this. At the same time, it's helpful if they're laughing a little because then they become more res responsive and receptive to what I have to offer when they're laughing. It always helps. So I try to do it through the lens of humor. But then we get into just a simple, pragmatic reason for writing. It's like you like got to write down what you're worried about, write down what you're afraid of, write down what you're concerned about, what that, right, you want to ask. Because it's like an actor, the first time they think they memorize their lines and they go into rehearsal and they forget all of them. So you're constantly going line, line, line. You're calling to the stage manager you know, to, to read out your lines because you know, the first rehearsal when you think you go off book and remember, you don't because you know, emotionally you don't. It's even more than that when your health is on the line, when your life is maybe even on the line. So that's a very pragmatic exercise that we do is this preparation for seeing your doctor or the kind of preparation you want to have when you have to break the news to someone that is really close to you and what words you want to use and how you want to use them. And so, yeah, it's amazing the kinds of things that we take for granted in our lives until we're faced with a traumatic moment. Speaking of faced in our lives with that traumatic moment, I am curious, how did this topic come onto your field of, of view? Like I, I want to write on about this topic is it what what what's the origins? Well, I, like actually, because when I did the Chicken Soup for the Soul book, right around the time it came out, actually just before in the year right before, while I was actually working on it, while I was working on the book, there was a study came out in the Oncologist, which is pretty much the Bible Journal of Oncology, that periodical, and. There was a study that had been done at the Lombardi Cancer Center, which is at Georgetown University. And they have, at that time, they were one of the only ones in the country. They sort of have, I, I don't know the exact name, but it's basically an arts department. And they have 
they were doing like some music therapy, I think a little, and, and painting. And this is a lot of cancer centers are doing that now. They do a lot of art therapy, painting and sculpture and things like that. Although sculpture, not so much because some of the chemicals in the clay are not good for people when they're in the midst of treatment, but painting and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And they were doing a writing program and it was a very, it was an experiment. So they found, and this was published in The Oncologist, this is all very, very well vetted. The National Institutes of Health were involved, and I think also, and they found that 20 minutes of expressive writing were helping people cope with the stress of what they were dealing with. It was helping them to communicate better with everyone they were involved with when they could actually express themselves. It was opening up things that they were able then to do that across the board. And so that study came out and a pharmaceutical company, I don't know if they were actively actively involved in that study or not, but they certainly knew a whole lot about it. And they this is also at a time 10 years ago now when pa- patient advocacy and patient services was really taking off. Mm. And there was some money being put behind it and some real concentration. And cancer centers were starting to get hip to how valuable all of that stuff was. We can't just treat the numbers and the blood tests and the pathology. We have to treat a human being. And so they were finally catching up with all of that. Mm-hmm. And there was support through other parts of that health industrial complex, if you will. And so I just hit at that right time that when the cancer book came out, that was just when they were starting to make those plans. And then they asked me if I could do a workshop. And I I had taught plenty. I had you know been teaching theater and, and all that kind of stuff and all different ages and you know children and adults for many years. So that part of it didn't phase me at all to be teaching, but to have that content, like to have to figure out a curriculum, that was tricky to try to break it down. People were interested to meet me in some ways because I had put that book together and they knew everybody in kind of the cancer world. A lot of people knew about that book when it came out, but that's not enough. I couldn't just sit on that and go, oh, aren't I cool? Because I put that book together. I mean, it's sort of like, so what? If you're diagnosed with cancer and you need help, the book is fine to read, but you, you really need to, what, how much are you really going to need to hear from me about you know what I did? But so I had to try to break it down. Right, so right. I looked at, I looked at, and it wasn't really about teaching people how to write a story that could be in the next version. I mean, that's all fine and good if that's a goal, but that's, you know, that's like one out of a hundred people are really maybe interested in, in doing that, aspiring to be writers. Maybe it's more, but it doesn't matter. But I wanted to do something that was really useful, really pragmatic and all the spiritual and, and, and the emotional stuff is all fine and good. And when that comes in, it's all there. But I thought, I have to focus this on real useful stuff. Like what's tangible? What skill sets can I help them with? What line of thinking can I open up their minds to that are going to be useful right now? Like literally right now. What has been the reaction from the patients, the families, the caregivers that have been through your workshops and, and learning how to communicate through through writing? What has been the reaction? I mean, what are you learning from them about this process that you've introduced on their behalf? Well, I think one indirect thing, but it's fundamental to me, and I, I don't necessarily do it on purpose, I think it just comes naturally to me too, is the the humor is a big part of, of, of it. And it's not like I'm not teaching it. I'm not trying to teach people how to, this is not a comedy construction class. It's not a stand-up writing class. It's not a physical comedy workshop. It's not, it's not that at all. It's just just seeing our, the situations that we share through, through a lens of humor or allowing it to be there because the elephant in the room is is cancer and the fear that comes with it and to respond to that right away. So there's this mix of really very clear-headed honesty and a certain playfulness to yes, it's a what what's more serious than a diagnosis of cancer that might be putting your life at risk? 
it's certainly going to turn it upside down and compromise it during the course of your treatment. Even if you already know you have a good you have a good outcome, and the, all the scientific evidence is there that you're going to have a good outcome, it's still going to be rough going to get there, to say the least. And not just for the person diagnosed, but everybody who comes in contact with them at home, at work, in the community. And so, at the same time, we take it seriously. We don't want to take ourselves too seriously. So we try to find that that balance because I also think physiologically, humor and laughter have a lot of healing qualities and often underestimated. So that has become an approach that I take. And it also just kind of comes naturally for me from having done lots of comedy. And it's also really a way to connect with people when you, when someone's smiling, whether it's, I don't mean necessarily laugh, ha ha, like, oh my God, what a funny joke that was. It's not about constructed jokes. It's just about more of a humorous approach to things and a lightheartedness and a whimsy that opens up communication. It opens up acceptance. It opens up people to kind of let their fears float just for a moment, just long enough to take in a new idea. I was just thinking it's a moment of just in some ways a respite for maybe a few seconds of separate themselves from the from the from the illness for just the, for just that moment in time. Exactly, Howard. And sometimes just what you said, just for those few seconds, a few seconds is all sometimes it takes to open up a new perspective or for somebody who can't get there right away when they see the people sitting next to him getting there. They're going, oh, that looks fun. That looks, th- look at those smiles. I, I want to have one too, <laughs> right? So, right. yeah, we, we kind of gently, gently help, help people to, to open up and relax and, and, and find that zone for themselves and then be able to figure out, okay, what prompts, what writing exercises, what, in a sense, manipulations can I give them so that they can find their way there on their own. David, are you going to continue to be delivering these workshops? Is it just you? Do you have a team? What is it your future? I sure wish I had a team. One of the ideas, thanks for that question. One of the ideas is, and I've done it a little bit, but I really want to get this more up to speed. And it's part of the problem is I'm so busy writing other books that I, some of them cancer related, some of them not, that I don't have enough time by myself to do all this. Ideally, what I want to do is, for example, you're in Chicago, come in, and I've, I've been actually been to Chicago a few times. I did the Lurie Cancer Center there, and I've done, I've been to the Rush University um, Cancer Center, I think three times doing programs there, and then Gilda's Club in Chicago and some other stuff. But for example, if I could come into the Cancer Center in Chicago mm-hmm. and be there and do several different workshops, but also at the same time help to train some of the people who are on the staff could be a patient, could be a survivor, could be a nurse, it could be uh, any, anybody else on staff who who's interested in this, who I can then help to give them the tools so that they can do a group and run a group on Tuesday nights and have and just facilitate it. It's not necessarily, and then they have my book. I mean, they also, they can have the books to, to guide them to always use for resources and then be available to communicate with them. For example, they like email me or call me like uh, three months later, say, Hey, we have this new group and there's more, this one patient who's really struggling. Maybe you have an idea about what I could do to help them break through that. You know, like that's the kind of thing that I want to set up so that has a broader reach and can help more people it's like like, that's very doable it's very doable yeah do you want to help me i would love it (laughs) i need i'm trying to find it's it's not easy to find the right people to do this and i've been trying but i i haven't been trying enough because like i said i didn't i don't have there's only 24 hours in the day i I would tell you what david i would take that challenge There, there is a organization here that i've done some work with called wellness house Mm-hmm. And it's out in the, the suburbs of Chicago, and it's for individuals, family members, patients who are, are going through this chronic illness. And it's not the medical care, but it's all the other care that goes in. You know, how do I, how does my life have to change, whether it's my job, my 
eating habits, my exercise habits, my job habits. I've gone in and done workshops for them Mm -hmm. on writing the resume or walking through. Here's how you navigate around the job interview when you're coming off of the... Oh, you know who does that? Uh, There's a big group called Triage Cancer. Yeah. They do that, especially like they help people navigate through work situations and all the insurance. Oh my God, that must be terrible. You know, I, I, I keep hearing that, how, you know, people navigating through that, but also how do you, how do you help your family get through it? Right. Yeah. It's not easy. Not easy. Oh, so I would definitely take you up on that challenge because I mean, just not only coming to a city training a group of people or a person to, to take on a, do a workshop, provide the mastermind activity afterwards, everybody comes together and you, then you've got the kind of the, the global lessons learned of here's what I'm doing in any given city, any given workshop, here's my issues with my patient. And then you then become the, the mentor, the, gu- the, the guide to help the, these individuals continue to deliver the workshop in their community. So that's definitely doable. Well, it, I, would, I would be so happy to talk to you about that separately at some point, whenever you let me know what's, what, what's, what's possible because I'm all over it. I would love to do that. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Listen, David, it's in, a question in, to bring it to get it to scale. So it can, it can really help more people because that's really in the end, there's, because there, there's no shortage of people who need the help. Well, you, you know, in, in, in opportunities like this, and again, I, I, I would love, let's have that conversation, but all you have to do is you, you take another venue, you, you, get through the learning and the lessons learned about what it takes to create the infrastructure to deliver the program. And, and then you just continue to build from there. So it's, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have that conversation. In any case, in the few minutes we have left, and I did warn you, time goes by very quickly. We are well past the 30 minute mark. So I, app- yeah. I appreciate oh, yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's been very nice to just talk to you like this. Yeah. I appreciate it. I can tell, by the way, you have a cold. So I, and uh, so you probably need your own cup of chicken soup, I think, but it's good for the soul. <laughs> a little bit. I get a little sniffle here. Yeah. It's just the weather in New York. It's like one day it's like 55, and then the next day it's 30. And then, yeah, just, yeah, it's just, yeah, I think my body's a little confused. It's not fun. Listen, in the time we have together, if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, where's the best place or places for them to go? There's two websites. One is rightforlife.info, but they can also just go to get a bigger cross section and also to contact me is tabatsky.com. T-A-B-A-T-S-K-Y dot com. Just my website. And that has like, that's home base for everything. All the different books that I've done and all the, like a lot of stuff about theater and contact info is there as well. So that, that would make the most sense. Fantastic. David, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. And just, this is such an important topic and, and I love not only hearing your background, but how your background, just being in the right place at the right time, meeting the, having those right conversations led to this body of work. And it, it's so very important. And I, I would love to, I wish we had gotten more into RX for Hope, the integrative approach to cancer care, because I mean, it's just cancer and cancer treatment is not one size fits all. And I, I love the whole topic around integrative medicine. It's just so fascinating. So, no, that's really integrating Eastern and Western approaches to medicine to really bring immunology and, and naturopathy in, into it. So that when people, for example, when people are getting chemotherapy, it's, it's really compromising their immune system. So at the same time, what Dr. Chen is doing, he's like, I can give them all the chemo- chemotherapy that's going to kill the cancer cells. But if I don't rebuild their immune system, what's the point? So that's what he does. And he has people who were told to go home. He, were, he, were, he had people, major cancer, cancer centers, told people we have nothing more we could do for them with advanced stage four cancers. And they came, they found, they found Dr. Chen, and they're still there. I've met them. I've been out there in Seattle. And they're, they're there 5, 10, 15 years later. 
dealing with cancer as a chronic disease. Yeah, I would love to, maybe we can work together. I would love to, to have Dr. Chen on this podcast to learn to learn more about him and his work. And perhaps we'll go a little deeper into, into the book itself and we can ask him, so what was it like working with David? <laughs> I just, again, thank you so much. And hopefully lots of other conversations we'll have, but thank you. You're welcome, Howard. Thank you. All right, folks, we have just been chatting with David Tabatsky, writer, editor, teacher, director, performing artist, and publisher of a whole number of books. But do check out Write for Life, Communicating Your Way Through Cancer, and Rx for Hope, an integrative approach to cancer care, which is his most recent books. We'll put links from the Amazon page onto our show notes. We'll also provide you with the show notes to his website, www.tabaski.com. And if you go out to this website, I mean, it's, it's packed with information and definitely places that you can go for your next steps, which include the various foundations and programs that David is running all within the, the context of cancer and fighting it and the whole social support network that exists. So lots of information and you'll, we'll provide the backlink to the site for you. So as I say, every podcast, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day, and we'll see you on the next episode of the Success Insight podcast. Take care, everyone. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com. 